Let's pray. Father, we give you praise and thanks for your mercy and your grace. This morning, Lord God, I pray as I have prepared and believe I've prepared the message that you wanted me to share. At the same time, Lord, I pray that you would bring life to those words. I pray that only the truth would go forth and only the truth would be received. And I pray, I just pray it in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A number of years ago, a friend of my wife's... Uh, is this dead too? Okay. A friend of my wife's uh, husband left her for another woman and she taunt, talked to my wife and, and Wendy ministered to her for some time. And, and after a few months, this lady gave her life to Christ. Uh, her marriage was never able to be reconciled. He ended up divorcing her and marrying this uh, other woman. Uh, and, but Wendy finally led her to Christ, helped her across the line to faith. She was a believer, loved the Lord, and yet there was a particular area of sin that she seemed to repeatedly fall into. And there would be apparent brokenness there and sadness and grief, and uh, they would be, when he would minister to her, and she would be free for a number of months, maybe even a year, and then she would fall back into it again. And finally, after two or three years of this, uh, she was set free. Wendy prayed with her, and there was just this, this certainty. And she never fell back into that sin ever again. And, and she met a, a, a Christian guy, and uh, they decided to get married. Uh, Wendy was her maid of honor. On the night of, of the wedding, she said this to Wendy, and it is my prayer that somebody will say this of me once before I die. And, and she said to Wendy, I knew that you always hated what I was doing, but I also knew that you loved me. I always knew that you hated what I was doing, repeatedly falling back into that sin, but I knew that you loved me. And, and, and to me, uh, God used Wendy. Wendy to help bring transformation to that lady's life, to see her through this life that she was living, to bring restoration uh, to her spirit, and to help her live a, a, a life of freedom. And I believe that God wants to use all of us to be examples to his church, examples of love to his church, examples of, of, of what it means to truly be a group of people that love one another. And you don't have to, to be a Christian for very long before you realize that Jesus talked about this love thing an awful lot, didn't he? He seemed to continually be talking uh, about love. And so in John 13, 34, he says, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Now, you might be different than me. You probably are. Uh, but I find this love thing probably one of the hardest things to do. It sounds so easy, doesn't it? Love one another. But for me, it's incredibly difficult to be the kind of, of person of love that I know Christ wants me to be. Are you like me too and sometimes wish that Jesus would have said, love one another and left it at that? If he had just said love one another, we could kind of put our own parameters on it, our own limits, our own boundaries, and we could say, yes, I will love one another, those one another's that, that like me. I, I will love those who are like me. I will love those who think the same way that I do. I will think, I will love those who treat me like I think I should be treated. But you see, Jesus knew us so well he knew that he couldn't leave it that open because we would indeed twist it and turn it to fit what we wanted that to say, to fit what we think loving one another is. So Jesus gave us the answer. Love one another as I have loved you. And whenever you see that one another in the New Testament, it's always talking about people within the church. It's not talking about people in the world. We'll look at that in two weeks. 
but, but it's talking about loving one another within the body of Christ. And, and we have been called as his church, as his uh, children, as his family, to make a difference in our world, but not just in the world, but also within, a, within our own midst. The church is not supposed to be some exclusive country club that says, you know, if you're just like us, if you think like us, come on in. It's, a, it's not a place where people carry out their kind of pet to-do projects. Well, I want to do this, so I will go to church. Yes, we are called to be a life-changing influence on our community, but we are also called to be a life-changing influence to one another, to those who are already here, who, who are part of this place that we call the family of God. And we are to be the hands and, and the feet and the heart of Jesus to those that are here, to those that we worship with every Sunday, and those that, that maybe attend other Bible-believing churches, and, 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 and we are to encourage and, and support them also and to love them. As we continue this series of, of what a healthy church looks like, and last week we saw that our number one priority as a healthy church is to reach up to God. But healthy churches also make it a huge priority to reach in to those who are part of the family of God, to reach in to other believers, to have healthy relationships within the church. And so again, in this passage that was read earlier, we see that it's written to the church, the one another's there, uh, in, in verse 11, if you go back a bit, it says that this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And again, the one another says we're talking about the body of Christ. We're to love our fellow Christians, as we heard in verse 16. The question is, how do we do that? How do we not just love our fellow believers, but how do we love them like Christ loved us? You see, and you probably already know this if you attend Airdale, but there are people here who are different than you. That, you. that you even disagree on some things. There are people here who would say that, that the gift of tongues is for today. And people who would say, no, 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 it was a signed gift. It's not supposed to be used today anymore. And there'd be people here who would say that the Bible places limits on the roles that women can have in the church. And those who would say, no way, there's no such thing. Women can be senior pastors, bishops, they can be whatever they want. Uh, and there are people who believe differently than us. You know what I would love to do? I would love to go back into the time of Jesus and sit around the fire. Because you, you see, you've got Simon the Zealot, who's one of the disciples. And he wants to overthrow the Roman, Roman Empire by force. That's what zealots wanted to do. They wanted to raise up an army and, and, and kick the Romans out of Israel. But in that same 12, you had Matthew, the tax collector, who cooperated with the Romans in collecting taxes. Now, don't you think there might have been the odd, interesting discussion around the campfire? I'd love to be there. And, and that happens to us, too. I don't know about you, but there's been times when I've said something in a group of Christians and something that I assume everybody agrees with. Everybody thinks the same as me. And I discover that in that group, I'm the only one who thinks like that. Now, obviously, they're all wrong. But it might happen the odd time, that, and very odd, that I'm wrong. Now, I don't say that when Wendy's here. So how do we get along in those terms? What do we do to say we want to be a healthy church, and a healthy church reaches in, and so I want to be one of the people, healthy people, in a healthy church that reaches in? 
What can we do to grow more loving toward others, to our fellow believers? Well, the text tells us three very important specific steps that we can take to reach in, in love, to the people of Arendelle Alliance and other Bible-believing churches. And the first thing that he says, that John says in verse 17, is that a healthy church, a healthy Christian, reaches in by opening our eyes. A healthy church reaches in by opening our eyes. He says, if anyone has the world's goods and, and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Do you remember in Luke chapter 10, in verses 25 to 29, and many of you will know the story, and if you don't, what it is is that this Jewish expert in the law comes up to Jesus, and he asked him, uh, and, and he's trying to trick him, of course. And he says, Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says to him, because he's an expert in the law, and he says, what does the law say? And the man says that I am to love God and my neighbor. And Jesus says, ah, you got it right. That's what you have to do. But you see... This lawgiver, again, is just trying to trick Jesus. So he doesn't care that he's supposed to love God and love people. He's trying to trick Jesus. So he says what really is a kind of a silly question in many ways. He says, oh, great, but who is my neighbor? Who's this one that I should love? And I get the impression as I read that that, that he was hoping that Jesus would say something like this. Well, your neighbor, that's only people who agree uh, with you. Uh, that's only the people in your immediate family. Uh, that's only the people of your race. It's only the people in the same economic space that you are in, the same social status. And in Ted, he tells this story of the Good Samaritan, uh, of the priest and the Levite who crossed the road rather than help him, and then a dreaded Samaritan enemy of the Jews. Uh, he comes along and he helps him. And it teaches us, among other things, that our neighbor is anyone that we have the opportunity to help. Let me say it again. Our neighbor is anyone that we have the opportunity to help. But here's the things, beloved. We have to be alert to the opportunities. We have to be alert to them. Sometimes they pop up right before us and... and, and We'd have to be blind not to see it. But other times, those opportunities are more subtle, a bit more hard to see. In in Matthew 9, 36, it says that when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on on them because they harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. And it seems to be that Jesus saw something that other people didn't see. The other people didn't see that people were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. But Jesus saw that. And and I think far too often we're blind. We we, we can't see. It's like we have blinders on. We can't see what's happening around us. And, And we see people who are bleeding around us and we say, well, they're not really that hurt. They're not in that much pain. Or we see somebody who's always alone and we say, well, they must like it that way. They must like to be alone. And we don't have the eyes to see the pain that they're really in. As one of her MS attacks, my wife, for about three weeks, lost all of her peripheral vision. And it was like she was looking through a a tunnel. And she couldn't see anything over here. And I think that's what we're like as Christians sometimes, is we see, but we don't grasp. So we see this person sitting by themselves. We see this bleeding person. We see this person who seems to to be very defensive a lot of the time. And we see that, but we don't see beyond to see why they are like that and what's going on in their lives. And I can tell you that Jesus wants to heal our sight. He wants us to see through those spiritual and compassionate eyes 
that he's given us when we received him as our Savior. And he wants to see. He wants to see those people, those fellow believers who are sitting next to you Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And he wants to see those people that you're in your small group with. And he wants you to see the people who serve on a committee that you serve on. He wants you to see that person who disagrees with everything that you ever say. If you say the sky is blue, they say it's purple. And they disagree with you on everything. But what he wants you to do is to see that they are not interruptions. They are not distractions. They have not been put in your life simply to irritate you, but they are divine appointments. They are people that he has put in your way, and he wants you to see their needs, to see their loneliness, to see their hurts, their disappointments. And he wants to give you the ability, the courage, not just to see it, but to do something about it. To actually step out and to reach out to them. But that means we have to risk getting below the surface issues in people's lives. And that's scary, isn't it? At least it is for me. Do I really want to walk up to somebody and say, you know, you really seem down today. Is everything okay? And have them say, well, it was okay till you came up to me. You know, and, and are we willing to take that risk and to step out? And it's scary. It's really scary. But I do believe that there is too much closed eye disease in the church today. And Jesus says that love does not close its eyes to the needs of our brothers and our sisters in the family of God. Love requires open eyes. Open eyes. Being a healthy church means that we have open eyes. But John also says it's not just having open eyes, as important as that is, but he says that a healthy church, a healthy church person, a healthy Christian reaches in by opening our hands. He says in verse 16, by this we know that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and, of course, the sisters. In verse 18, it goes on and says, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. in deed, and in truth. How much of our talk as a church is talk? And how much of it is word and deed? Where I don't just tell you I love you, but you see that I love you. You see that I care for you and I want to help you. But what does it mean to lay down our lives for people? And I think most of us see a picture of, of a one-time heroic act. You know, a, a, a policeman, a firefighter, a first responder who, who rushes into a burning building and, and saves somebody or, or, you know, does something heroic that, that is going to make it to the morning news. Or people who, who would have died for their faith to stand up for what they believe in. A, a, a Dietrich Bonhoeffer or Martin Luther King Jr. And, and, and we say that's what it means. Those men actually died. And, and as Pastor uh, Matt prayed for the persecuted church, that there are more Christians dying today uh, for their faith, just for their faith, than there ever has been in the history of the church. And that's what it would mean to die for our brothers and sisters. But we need to remember what John said in verse 17 that we've already talked about. That to lay down our life for another person is simply to respond to people that are in need. To lay down our life 
for our fellow believers means that I open my hands to actively help them meet their needs. Practical, concrete acts of love in the ordinary, everyday matters of life. Things that will never make it to the morning news. Things that you will never be known for. Things that people may not even know that you did. And yet we're called to do that. In the original language that the New Testament was written in, this word ought, that we ought to do this, is a word that does not mean a one-time event, but it means that, that it's a regular, ongoing, even a daily responsibility, a, 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 responsi- a, a, a duty, not just to great heroic acts, but we are called to love God the people that we see, to lay down our lives, not just for the people that we're willing to lay down our lives for, that we choose who we're going to love in that way, but to love the people right around us, and especially those that we see in need. The reality is this. In Canada especially, the chances are just about nil that you're ever going to be called to die for someone. But I can guarantee you, and I do mean guarantee you, I can guarantee you something a lot more difficult than dying for somebody. And you can count on it happening 100%. That even if you don't die for them, you will be given the opportunity to be inconvenienced for someone. Someone that you see needs help, and it's at a time when you feel too busy or too tired, or too whatever. And so when that time of inconvenience comes and that need comes up, how will we respond? How will we handle it? Will we say as we open our eyes and we see a need, will we now also open our hands and do whatever we can, even when it's not easy? even when it's going to cost us our time and our energy, and heaven forbid, perhaps even some of our money. Are we going to do that? And it's not, some might say it's not laying down your life, but in some ways maybe it's more difficult, it's worse because we live to tell about it. And we love to do that, we love to tell people how wonderful a person I am. Do you know that so-and-so in the church here, he needed some money? I gave it to him. Oh, yeah, it was a lot of money, but I just felt God calling me to do it. Or so-and-so needed some food. And so I went to the grocery store, and I bought a bunch of food and took it over to him. And, and so we, 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 the, the hard part about not dying is that we live to tell people about what we've done. And we use it to promote ourselves. So are we going to share those times and talents and treasures? Are we going to share of ourselves wherever and whenever we have the opportunity? And so are you today, the people of Arendelle Lines Church, are our hands open to the Lord today? Are, are your hands open to one another here this morning? maybe to other believers, are your hands open to them? And to say, I will do what I can, Lord, to help the people that you show me. And when was the last time you did that? When was the last time that you can say, my eyes were open, I saw it, and I actually did something about it? And so if Arendelle wants to be a healthy church, and if we want to be healthy Christians, we're going to open our eyes, and we're going to open our hands. But John also says, again, back in verse 17, that a healthy church reaches in by opening our hearts, by caring. And again, that's risky, that's scary. I love what what C.S. Lewis said. To love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. 
If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, and irredeemable. The only place outside heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all the dangers of love is hell. And every last one of you in this room, I would hazard a guess, has experienced the pain of opening your heart to somebody and they stomped on it. They rejected you, they mocked you, You help them, and then all of a sudden, they do something back. We met a young couple one time, and he had just got out of jail. And so we said, come live with us in our little tiny apartment where there was my wife and I and our baby, and the two of them and their baby moved into our dinky little apartment. And they paid us nothing. We asked for nothing. That's why. We just said, no, we don't want anything. Just get back on your feet. I knew what it was like to get out of jail and and need to get back on feet. And we opened our hearts. We opened our home. We opened our cupboards, our fridge. And one night we went out and we came back and they were gone. And so was our stereo, my cowboy boots, and my harmonica. And they had taken a whole bunch of our stuff and we were, we were kind of bugged at first. And then we said, well, Lord, if you want them to steal your cowboy boots, I guess that's up to, to you. Everything we own is yours. But we were hurt. This couple lived with us for two or three months, and, and we thought that we had given everything that we could give. And that's hurtful. And so sometimes what we do is we say, okay, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not opening my heart. I know what it's like to serve a church for 10 years that you loved and you gave your heart to. And then a few families in the church said, we don't care about your heart, and stomped all over it to the point that you leave that church. I know what that's like. And I know how it hurts. But I know that I can't close my heart off. If we're going to learn to love like Jesus, we'll open our hearts like he did. Somebody said the biography of Jesus can be summed up in these six words. I have compassion for the crowds. What was Jesus' life all about? He had compassion for the crowds. Do we have compassion for one another within Arendelle? Do we have compassion for people of of other Christian backgrounds that that we may disagree or agree with, but do we have compassion? In verse 17, John says, but if anyone has the world's uh, goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Did you hear those words, beloved? They scare me. They scare me. And why? Because if I don't have compassion toward the needy, if my heart doesn't break for the things that break God's heart, you know what he says? I am not filled with God's love. And that's scary for me. It's awful. It's so simple, and yet the consequences are awful. If I say, no, I actually don't have compassion for people. You know what the end of the verse says? We are family. And all that that entails, which means sometimes we get along, sometimes we don't, sometimes we agree, sometimes we disagree. But we are family. And so we need to be willing to open up our hearts, to take those risks with one another. I, I've been thinking so much lately uh, in preparing for the message in two weeks 
Why isn't the church making a difference in the world? Why is it that, that, that there something like 8% of Christian churches in North America are growing? And 2% of those are growing because of reaching lost people. The rest are just shuffling the deck, going from one church to another. I don't understand that. It breaks my heart. And could it be maybe, just throw this out for your consideration, could it be that we're not reaching the world because they see how we treat each other? Could it be? When I lived in my hometown, I was a boozer, I was a doper. But I knew one thing for sure. If I was ever going to attend a church, it would not be Camrose Alliance Church. Why? Because they went through about a pastor a year. And so I knew that I was never going to go to that church. It was a small enough town that we knew what happened in most of the churches. And I wondered, could it be? that the church in North America is not growing because they look at us and they say, that's not for me. I don't want to go where there's all that fighting. I have enough at home. If we're going to show the world that Jesus is who he says he is, then we, his bride, his church, need to be walking the walk. Not just singing the songs, not just walking, uh, talking the talk, but are we actually walking like Jesus? John says, open your hearts. Put your love into action. Just do it. And so my challenge to us, beloved, is that we show other people who Jesus is. We start here in the body of Christ, as strange as that sounds. I love winning lost people, but we don't start there as a church. We start right here within us. And, and, and if we do that, I can tell you this, we will not have room for the people who will want to become a part of this church. We will have to start doing seminars on crowd control. Because they will look at us and they will say, I want what they have. They won't even know it's Jesus. But they'll just say, look at their relationships. Look how they love one another, how they care for one another. I want some of that. That's the kind of church that people are looking for. They're looking for a real church. A church that says, that's really risky, but we're going to do it anyway because it's what God wants us to do. And we cannot fool God if we turn our eyes away from the opportunities that he puts in our paths, he knows that. If we don't open our hands when the opportunities come along and do something about them, we're not fooling God. He sees that. He knows if we keep our heart closed up. And we say, I'm not going to open it to anyone or anything. We're not kidding anyone but ourselves because God knows. But John doesn't even stop there. He goes on to tell us, if you decide to live your church life like this, if you decide to be a church that opens your eyes and opens your hands and opens your hearts, this is what's going to happen. And so let me just read it again, although it was already read. All i got to do is find it. Uh, beginning with verse 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, condemn us we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we will receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit he has given us. If we decide to live this way as a church, if we decide to live this way as the Christians who make up Arendelle Lyons Church, what's going to happen? Verse 21 says, we're going to have the blessing of confidence before God. We'll be confident because we know that we're living for him. Verse 22 says that we'll have the blessing of answered prayer. And verses 23 and 24, the blessings of knowing, one, knowing that we are one with Christ and that he is one with us. A number of years ago, a, a Japanese magazine had a, on one of its pages a picture of a butterfly. But it wasn't a, a beautiful butterfly. It was all gray. 
no color. But here's the interesting thing. When you put your hand on that butterfly, some kinds of special inks or something in it began to change color. And the butterfly went from being a, a gray, dull butterfly to being this beautiful, beautiful butterfly, transformed into this rainbow of color. And beloved, I want us to know that people within our church, yes, people outside too, but people inside our church are hungry. They're hungry for the life-changing touch of someone who cares, who really cares, who has the courage to say, I haven't seen you in church for a few weeks. Is everything okay? You look kind of down to me today. Are you okay? You look sad. How's your life going? I've been thinking about you. I've been praying for you. Anything I can specifically I can pray for? People are longing for that. To be able to come to church and know that someone cares for me. Cares enough to ask the questions. The difference that we as individuals or as a church are going to make is determined by how much we love one another. And how much we love one another is revealed by how much we're willing to show our love. Not just talk about it, but show it. Because love is not a feeling. It's an action. The opposite of love is not hate. It's apathy. And it requires us to open our eyes and our hands and our heart. And my prayer for Arendelle Lyons, both while I'm here and when I'm gone, is that Arendelle Lyons Church will be a place where people see, they do, and they care. Let's pray.